This is amazing. We are physically sitting on the bus that Rosa Parks was riding on when she refused to sit in the back of this very bus. <laughs> it's it's uh, almost surreal. But we're at the, uh, the Henry Ford, uh, one of the finest museums in the world, and literally sitting on Rosa Parks' bus that was driving in the streets of Montgomery. Where she made that, that quote that I just was telling Robert about. It's, you know, you'd think there'd be some big quote, but what she said that no one ever forgot was no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> You know, when, uh, when Robert and I, it was probably about 10 or 12 years ago, I had an assignment uh, to write a story about uh, a folk singer by the name of Guy Carawan, who turns out was a, a pivotal musical figure in the civil rights movement. And he worked as uh, kind of in charge of cultural expression at the Highlander School in Montagal, Tennessee. And so Robert and I actually went down to the Highlander School, which is no longer there, but it's in a different spot. And the Highlander School was this place where a lot of the strategy for the civil rights movement was planned. And Rosa Parks was one of the students uh, at one of the workshops before the Montgomery bus boycott. And one of the things that always stuck in my mind is at the end of all these workshops, they would always ask, they'd go around the circle and they'd ask everybody who was there how they plan to take what they've learned back to their community. And Rosa Parks at that time, I'm not quoting her exactly, said, I'm not quite sure what I'll do, but I know I'll do something when I get back to Montgomery. <laughs> uh, and it turns out she, she did. You know, the myth is that Rosa was just an ordinary woman riding a bus that day. But the truth is, she was, she was kind of chosen as the person to do that. Isn't that correct, Robert? It's, yeah. As far as we understand, I mean, there was a lady who was arrested earlier, um, several, several weeks earlier, but the idea was that you needed somebody who was a pillar in the community that had an unimpeachable reputation who would galvanize a community once they found out that Rosa Parks, you know, this, this, this Upstanding, symbol, yep, the symbol. Would, would, was arrested. Then she was, in, in, in a very real sense, she was the start of the civil rights movement and many other people, including a young minister by the name of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, came on later, sort of in support of or uh, joining forces with this, this grassroots concept of, of protesting these laws. So just recently I had this, oppor this amazing opportunity to actually sit in the kitchen of Dr. King's house in Montgomery, Alabama, where he was a young preacher and came there to preach and to also sort of head this movement that was starting because of what, what Rosa did. Uh, you know, and I got to actually touch the kitchen table where he had that midnight mm. epiphany, where he was really asking God whether or not he's doing the right thing. On that particular day, his wife fielded 40 threatening phone calls. And at midnight, he poured himself a cup of coffee and he reached into the deepest part of his soul and asked if he was doing the right work. And a voice told him that he was absolutely doing the right work. Mm. And, uh, you know, to, to be in that kitchen wow. meant the world to me in, in that city of Montgomery, Alabama. And, and this bus reminds us that there are so many amazing artifacts and so many amazing um, objects and, and, and locations that remind us of the courage that people had 50 years ago 
that have affected great change in our lives and that it's one of the great challenges is to get past all of the distractions that present themselves to let folks know that this is still important. This is amazing work. 50 years ago is a blink of an eye, but whenever my wife and I, you know, go on a cruise or when we travel down south, it always sort of is in the back of my mind that, you know, when somebody's offering me a drink on a cruise ship, <laughs> I'm thinking the only way that I would have been on this cruise ship 50 years ago is if I was offering the drinks. Or when you walk into a, you know, a restaurant in the Deep South and people greet you warmly and ask you what you'd like. You know, you have to remember that 50 years ago, those same people would not have greeted you so warmly, would have asked you to go around to the back door or to leave the establishment. And that didn't happen by accident. You know, First of all, I think people today aren't necessarily aware of the physicality that was required to change these laws. You know, people had to organize themselves or to be organized, they had to organize money to overturn the Jim Crow laws that had Rosa Parks being asked or being told to move from one part of the bus to another. And that meant that folks had to walk to work or they had to carpool or they had to find different ways to get there. They, they were physically affected and physically involved in this movement. And we've both experienced uh, being on a bus recently to go to Lansing, Michigan um, for a cause. And there's something about having to deal with miles going by that makes you sing. I mean, <laughs> you need that. You need, if, you, if you're physically marching, you need that rhythm of marching that encourages you and boldens you just like, um, I, I guess, if you, were, if you were marching to a battle. You need that music. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Just like the tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. Bump it up one time, ready? We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Just like the tree. Standing by the water, we shall not be moved. Oh, we shall not be moved. Keep in mind, this was all happening at the end of the 1950s, at the beginning of the 1960s, and this was the beginning of television news as well. And people, and you know, that's the thing. So much of this movement, I think, was seemed spontaneous because it seemed like a story that was unfolding on the news. But the truth is it was highly planned out and, and quite frankly it was planned out by very young people. A lot of young ministers from places like Fisk University in Nashville, uh, you know, these were mostly young folks. And I know when, when James Bebel went down to um, Birmingham to start organizing there, he went not just to the colleges, but to the high schools and to the middle schools. I mean, he was recruiting kids who really, when you think about it, really had the biggest stake in this because this was going to be their future. Those kids are now old people who are reaping the benefits of having the hoses turned on them in the park right outside their school, right. having the dogs unleashed on them right outside their school. I think it was brilliant that this was a young people's movement. Right. I think that was one of the stars that had to align for this to happen. It didn't it just seem like it seemed like it all came together at the right time under the right circumstances. And for me, the fact that it was all done in a nonviolent way mm. just makes it even more effective, makes it even more important because you know, you can beat on me, but I'm not going to beat back. And what, did, what picture did that create on the evening news? Right. So America had to see, and America had to see an image that was so different from how it viewed itself that once you see um, these young people being kicked in the head and beaten and, and water hoses turned on them, 
America had to say, this cannot That's be not America. Us. That's it's right. not us. You know, we've got to do something about this. And when you think about it, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I think Reverend King was 39 when he was assassinated. So you're right. This was very much a young people's uh, movement. And in fact, uh, again, when you saw people being beaten, you were looking at young people. Um, well, yeah, and now, you're, now that young person is Congressman John Lewis. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, those, are the exactly. Pe- those were the folks. And the beneficiaries of that uh, would be me and Matt. Because, you know, you think about this, too. This was not just African Americans trying to get uh, it, an advantage, but this was also a fight for people of conscience of all colors and all races and, you know, all creeds who didn't want to live in an America like the, like the America that they saw um, in Selma with Bull Connor. They didn't want to live in that America either. Yeah. The, the, you know, the truth is, and, and the more I study this, the more I go and visit these people, you know, as long as somebody's not free, I'm not free. <laughs> you know, that's, that's why this is not just an African-American fight. This, because freedom is for all. And if one person, it's, it's, it's that weak link in this chain, you know, mm-hmm. and we're only as strong as the weakest link in that chain. And if one of those, one of those uh, links is, is somebody who isn't free, then that's the same chain I'm part of too. So we gotta fix it for all. Everybody doing okay? Well, my name is Matt Watroba. This is my musical partner and best friend, Robert Jones. On the count of three, can you say, hi, Matt and Robert? One, two, three. I think that the work that we do is important because um, people, I think, are now lulled into a false sense of of, uh, security. I think that um, folks think everything is all right and that we live in a post-racial, and racist society um, that if you are if you just work hard enough there's this, this dominant narrative if you work hard enough um, the color of your skin no longer matters your religion no longer matters all this stuff is, is is in the past so get over it but only thing you need to do is just remember that when the Oklahoma City bombing happened that immediately folks assumed that it was an Arab American who had done it and every Arab American that I know and know of was on alert. There were people stopping um, Arab Americans uh, who were as American as they were and accusing them of being enemies of the state until they found out that it wasn't an Arab at all. It was a homegrown, you know, white American. So that lets you know that we are not as as post-racial as we think we are. And, you know, for me, I think music, like all art, uh, has a way of affecting people differently. You know, we could go into a school and we could lecture kids about diversity, and people do that all the time. That's getting into the head. I think what art does, what music does, storytelling, painting, is it changes the heart first and then the mind. Mm -hmm. And to me, that path seems to be the most effective route for sustainable change, especially sustainable change of mind. I love art for that reason. It has a way of changing the heart first and then the head second.